All right, welcome everyone. Sorry, Dr. Lambert. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. I can imagine there might be a few more folks joining us, um, but let's go ahead and get started because I'm just so super excited to, to get started. Um, I'm Laura Cardella, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and director of medical student education and psychiatry. Thank you all for joining us for the annual Meyerowitz Lecture. It's just so wonderful to have folks here in the audience woo, and also online. Um, we're doing a hybrid model um, to share in this uh, special experience. I'd like to thank the Meyerowitz family who is here with close friends, both in person and online. So thank you um, for making this special occasion happen. Uh, the Sanford Meyerowitz Memorial Fund was established in 1977 as a memorial to Dr. Meyerowitz, as you see there, a 1954 graduate of the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, and at the time of his death at a young age of 50, was the Associate Dean of Medical Education here at your SMD. The fund was established by a committee with his family support to create a living memorial in support of Dr. Meyerowitz's many and numerous interests and enthusiasm. He was actively engaged in medical education, clinical psychiatry and psychoanalysis and uh, psychosomatic medicine, as well as arthritis research. He made important contributions to the relationship between undergraduate and medical education. And the Meyerowitz Lecture is hosted each year by the departments of psychiatry, neurology, medical education, and medicine. And this year, the Department of Psychiatry has the pleasure of hosting. During his time here at University of Rochester, Dr. Sanford Meyerowitz impressed just about everyone he came into contact with. In George Ingalls' own words, Dr. Meyerowitz had, quote, an incredible capacity to influence people in the ways that people should be influenced, to work together in common tasks, to resolve difficulties and problems, to identify and facilitate roles. He also said that in some remarkable, remarkable way in Sandy's presence, no matter what the intensity of our personal interests and goals might be, we simply could not be petty, mean, or small. So we are delighted to be able to honor his legacy with today's speaker, who is such a fitting representation of who Dr. Meyerwitzes was and the lessons he taught those around him. Dr. Hel Kelly Harding is a University of Rochester School of Medicine graduate, 20 years actually, class of 62. She completed her, oh sorry, 2002, sorry. Yeah, my math is wrong, um, 2002. She completed her psychiatry residency at Columbia University and went on to become an NIMH research fellow in biological psychiatry and psychosomatic medicine on unexplained physical symptoms and then obtained a master's in public health from Columbia. She worked as a psychiatrist in the emergency um, psychiatry and more recently in private practice. She has been actively involved in medical student education and teaches at their school. Um, she has more recently um, been given lectures across the globe on emotional and social health and kindness. And she has written an outstanding book, The Rabbit Effect, Live Longer, Happier and Healthier with the Groundbreaking Science of Kindness. It is so fitting that she is coming to speak about the benefits of kindness in Dr. Meyer, which is an honor. Dr. Harding, we appreciate your patience with us as this is the third date that we scheduled for lecture over the last two years because of COVID. So I'm just so excited that the Time has finally come. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you all. I can't even tell you. I, oh, I have to stay over here because the Zoom folks. Um, really, it's it's just what a milestone that it's been two years, almost to the day that this lecture was planned, and we had no idea what the future held for us when we first planned this. But here we are, and it's really such a treat to be here and such a honor to um, Dr. Marowitz sounds so incredible. And I think so much of what we talk about here today is actually so in line with what I understand of his legacy and his family and all that makes medicine great. So thank you all. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see where the clicker is at. Ah. Let's see. Yes, 
some logistics slides here. All right, so kind of so today I want to talk with you all about something for those of you that are clinicians, a tool that you have, and those of us that are humans, just a superpower that you have every single day. You actually brought it with you here today. And it's just a question of how and when you want to tap into it. You know, when most people think about health, they think about, you know, trips to the doctor. They think about maybe diet, exercise, sleep. But we're going to talk about uh, something that's a vital and often overlooked part of health, which is kindness. So before we begin this work, um, I want to say I actually do have a disclosure, which is that I am human. And um, all of you are human too. And so what that means is that None of us are kind all the time, um, including myself. And I have to laugh because as I was preparing this presentation on kindness, I actually snapped at my children. So um, it's one of those things that I think it's good from the outset just to acknowledge that kindness is a practice and it's something that we work out every single day. And I know in all the different roles that you all fill, you're doing it in different ways. And so we'll, we'll celebrate that. I also, um, we're going to cover like, you know, decades of public health research in the next 35 minutes or so. So I just ask that you maybe as you're listening, think about something that resonates with you and that you want to jot down or try to remember. And then something that might be of use to somebody that you know um, or that you want to teach someone else. So jot it down for them too. Does that sound good? So for those of you that think kindness is a fluffy subject, I'm just going to go ahead and support that right now by um, telling you a story about rabbits. And this story actually takes place back in the late 1970s when a lovely researcher by the name of Dr. Robert Neerum was studying the relationship between diet and heart health. And so he designed this very straightforward experiment where he gave these genetically identical rabbits the same high fat diet. And he expected all of the rabbits to have the same health outcomes. And when it came time to look at the results, he um, looked under the microscope and in fact found vastly different health outcomes, like 60% different. And being good researchers, they thought there was something wrong with the protocol. So um, they checked everything out and everything fully checked out. And then they looked at themselves and they realized that all the rabbits that had done better were all under the care of the same researcher. And it turned out that she wasn't just feeding the rabbits, she was also picking up the rabbits, she was petting the rabbits, she was talking to the rabbits, she was basically giving them love and kindness. And much to Dr. Neerum's credit, he realized, could it be that somehow the social environment was actually changing the biology of these animals? And the most easy thing to do, for those of you who do research know, would have been to just redo the experiment without that researcher. But instead, he thought this was too amazing to pass up. And he said, I'm, I was a basic science researcher. This was not in my area, but I felt this could be too big to ignore. So they went ahead and they replicated the study and they got the exact same results and they published it in the journal Science. And that was back in the 1970s. And since then, there have been decades of public health research that support that. But he was one of the first people to show that kindness can actually change biology. So let's talk for a second about kindness. So what is kindness? So researchers define it as an act that enhances the welfare of others as an end in itself. But I don't have to tell any of you in this audience what kindness is because you have lived it, you have given it, you have received it, 
all of us as human beings have experienced this. So actually, let's just take a second now and think about an act of kindness that you either saw or did in the last week. And it doesn't have to be anything big. It could be, you know, smiling at a stranger you pass on the street, a conversation you had with somebody um, at the grocery store, it could be helping out a neighbor or a child, anything. So just take a second and think about what that was. And then if you could also think about how that made you feel in the moment while that was while you were either doing it or witnessing it. And go ahead and raise your hand if any of these adjectives capture that feeling. Um, you felt seen or valued. Okay, I'm seeing some like fingers kind of coming up. <laughs> um, or appreciated or loved. Right, so this is exactly what kindness is. Um, kindness is really positive social connection. And that's pro-social behavior in uh, more fancy terms, but what everyone else knows as kindness. And um, just a sort of startling fact. Um, so for those of you public health people in the room um, and so it turns out, you know, that medical care is absolutely critical as it is for every human being, probably only accounts for about 10 to 20% of our overall health status. And it turns out while genes play a role, thanks to discoveries in the field of epigenetics, it turns out they're not quite as set in stone as we once thought. And instead, it turns out that our everyday social world is actually the largest driver of our health. This means how we are treated in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our broader community. All of that matters really deeply to our health. And of course, this comes as no surprise to this crowd, right? We're here at the home of the biopsychosocial model. And this is something that is so critical to Rochester. So while I'm telling this story, I also feel like the story is having a homecoming right now because this is really where the seeds of this whole story came from. And I just want to say how grateful I am to be able to be back here and sharing all this with you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about all of that. So of course, this is Dr. Engel's model. Um, he published his original paper in Science, as many of you know, uh, in 1977. And then he came up with a sort of square diagram of the biopsychosocial bio model and what's that he published in 1980. What's remarkable about this is just how right he was, right? So when you go back and look at those original papers and think about what makes health, what makes the definition of health, he talked about how we were on this very narrow march in our country, uh, very narrowly prescribing. Everything okay? <laughs> okay. Um, nar very narrowly prescribing how we defined health. And what's so exciting is that since he wrote those seminal papers, we now have you know four decades more of public health data that reinforces his finding. So um, you'll have. To have to excuse my excitement over this animation, but we're going to time travel forward <laughs> four decades. And then um, what we did is, um, or is to take, um, take Dr. Engel's original model and then marry it with the data and the terminology from public health, which um, again, there are just ample studies supporting what he's done, but Dr. Engel's model was done before many of those terms were done. And this is a work in model progress. It's not complete either as we continue to learn more, but it gives us an idea of all these different areas of health that are impacting us. And of course, this is what, you know, in public health, we call the social determinants of health. But when you look at that positive pro-social connection, it's what everybody else calls kindness in all the different areas of our lives. So we're actually gonna go through some of those different areas right now. We'll talk a little bit about the data, and um, then we'll also 
talk um, a little bit about some practical tips that you can use as you continue to think about this. So just to start, um, so we know that when we think about our one-on-one -on -one relationships and also our social ties and our, our friendships, our colleagues, everything like that, um, just that, what a critical role this plays in our health. So we know that um, from the longest running study that was done at Harvard over many decades, shows that if there's one thing you can invest for in your health, it's positive social connections, positive supportive social connections. And what's really great and exciting about this is it's both deep connections and then it's also casual connections that you have with people. Um, and so this is what is known for researchers as weak ties, but it turns out weak ties are also tremendously important for communities and for our overall health. So on that note, actually, since we're sitting here in a community, finally in a room together, um, if you just want to take one minute and maybe wave at someone you haven't yet had a chance to say hi to or introduce yourself to someone just for a quick minute, um, that would be great. We'll take advantage of that or say hi to someone you brought and ask how their day is going. <laughs> I'm fairly soft-spoken, so I apologize if it's been hard to hear me. All right, wonderful. Um, the other thing is, so from the moment you wake up from and then start your day to the moment you go to bed at night, you are constantly having choices and opportunities to positively support other people. And I, it's truly a choice. So starting in your home, who, depending who's in your home, um, you can think about ways to connect with people. They're fascinating studies it, that for people that are in your home that you feel comfortable with, giving hugs have been shown to boost immune system. Um, they're actually also thinking about um, and it's a shame because that's something the pandemic has really impacted is human touch because positive supportive touch is important to so many people um, in so many different ways, particularly with the patients that we serve. Um, but it's one of those things too that is such a piece of this. But for some people, you know, the real heroes of the pandemic are pets, I feel like for many people that have been isolated and at home living alone, pets have served an imp important purpose. And um, there are actually some studies that people prefer their pets over their partner sometimes anyway. So uh, maybe that's for the best. This is actually my dog, Athena, here. Um, I, anyhow, so we're going to continue to think about that in all the different ways it comes together. The other big area to think about is work. So, you know, we spend a third of our lives at work, and yet it's somehow often overlooked as a key component of our health. But we know from the longitudinal white health studies that were done in the UK that it's often the most important driver in our health, which is also quite shocking because it implies that it's not only good to have a good doctor, but it's good to have a supportive boss, a supportive colleagues, a, a workplace that also um, makes you feel included and gives you autonomy seem to be the more protective factors. The interesting thing is people who feel supported at work actually um, are known to have better health in part too because they don't use healthcare as much as other, the healthcare services as other people who don't, who don't feel supported at work. Um, sometimes up to 50% reductions in, in healthcare usage, which is quite striking. Um, and also healthcare, our workplaces are not always as kind as they could be. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too, of some ideas of things that we could change. But I just think as we continue to think about, you know, when we're, how can we help not only um, the people we serve, but our colleagues and also ourselves, work is a, is a big one and a, one that's always present and something that we can do a change in. So actually, uh, the World Economic Forum picked up this quote that I had said um, on a, a podcast. Um, it says, you can probably toss out your human resources manual and just rewrite it as be kind. Um, 
and they ran it and ran it and ran it, which also makes me happy because it sounds as though this is far outside of medicine, something that people are thinking about. And for those of you that do neuroscience or just knowing how the brain works, it makes sense too, because actually when we're supported in our workplaces, we're better problem solvers, we're more creative, um, because we're not using the more primitive part, fear-based parts of our brain, but we're using our higher cortical functioning, and um, which is also a huge bonus. So education, this is what we're doing here right now. So congratulations to all of us. But education is an incredible part of our health and our patient's health. And um, there is a statistic that I have to share with you that Dr. Wolf from Virginia did this research that showed, this meta-analysis that showed that for every one life saved by biomedicine, education saves eight. So for every one life saved by biomedicine, education saves eight, which is pretty amazing because I don't think most teachers necessarily know, and for those of us that are educators know, that what that work is actually part of health and to just be aware that that is serving people. And what's cool about it and a bit mysterious is it seems to have both direct and indirect effects. And what's also amazing is it's throughout our lifespan, right? So we're constantly learning and it can be a way that we can continue to encourage patients and encourage ourselves to keep doing it. I think it's one of the biggest gifts of medicine that we get to do continuing medical education and that that's part of it. I think it's partly what makes it so fun um, and education, of course, ties so closely to purpose. And what's so neat about purpose is actually what got me interested in this work to begin with. And that's the idea that, so, and, you know, this mind-body connection that's so fascinating and um, so, so intriguing. Like, why is it that some patients fare better with illnesses than others? Why is it that people, you know, we can't, you know, we, human bodies get sick and yet some people are able to navigate those, those challenges better. And what's fascinating is some of the data that's come out around purpose recently and that people who have a strong sense of purpose actually are at lower risk of all cause mortality. So lower risks of strokes, of heart disease and also dementia, which is, quite striking. Um, and the other piece of this that's an important part of kindness I want to highlight is that it's not just receiving kindness, it's also doing kindness. And purpose is so individually defined. It's something that matters to you. But at the same time, it can be something very simple. Like, um, you know, there are the lovely studies that Atul Gawande highlighted in being mortal about taking care of a plant that those, um, that the uh, the people who had a small task of choices and taking care of things actually did better and had longer survival and functioned better. Um, we can think about purpose broadly. And I also, I, in, oops, I'm off my purpose slide, but I intentionally put this picture um, of the bend in the Colorado River uh, that to speak to flow too. So like, where do you find your flow states? Maybe it's in the hospital seeing patients, maybe it's teaching, maybe it's at quiet times with your kids at home. It can be so varied, but it's one of those things to just pay attention to because it turns out it's got good health benefits as well. Oops. And of course, the neighborhood. So we know that um, in America, uh, you know, our, our zip code's a better predictor of our health than our genetic code. Uh, which in public health we call ZNA. Um, and of course, this affects everything from, you know, how safe we feel, which, you know, there have been studies that have shown that um, security in neighborhood is affected to telomere length um, with studies that were done with kids in New Orleans, um, to everything to our cortisol levels, um, how close we are to noise, how close we are to nature can influence whether we have a prescription for an antidepressant or not. Um, and also what's been exciting is um, studies that show that proximity to nature can reduce pain um, and, and it can also um, not, it, not only in terms of all the benefits, but in the hospital, you know, there's that classic old study, like if you look out at a garden, you're likely to get discharged a day earlier, ask 
for less pain meds and also bother the nurses less. So we can think broadly about how nature in our neighborhood and our workplaces influences us. So easy peasy, all the science says that it comes down to this. If we want um, to be healthier and happier, we should just all be kind, right? Like no problem. Um, but of course, that's not easy from conflict in homes to conflicts at work to um, you know, social inequalities to political differences and divides to war. We are not doing so well with this right now, um, despite how challenging that is. And you know, it's funny because I think oftentimes going around talking about kindness, people think, well, that's easy, I'm kind, it's, it'll be fine. But the reality is this is very hard, even though we all kind of know at our gut instinct that it's the right thing to do. And let's just talk for a moment about where we're at when it comes to our healthcare setting. So, so this is a graph that's showing, um, here, let me look here so I'm not bending backwards, um, showing health system performance versus spending. And it's probably not a surprise for anybody in this room that the US consistently underperforms when it comes to this. We spend way more for not getting the same quality of care compared to the other wealthy nations of the world. And this is um, from the 2021 report, but this graph has pretty much looked like this for decades. And what this means is that every single day in this country, people are dying of preventable illnesses that we could do something about but we have to be aware of it to be able to make a change. Um, we know that there is a social gradient in the United States, and this is actually true if you look across the world as well, but in the US in particular, looking at life expectancy of birth. So, you know, very, and this not varies not only by state, but also by county. And um, I just wanna highlight, you know, part of this for the reasons and the differences are historical. So. Um, you're probably familiar with redlining, which has affected many cities. And starting back in the 1930s, um, following the Great Depression, um, how cities were invested in and reinvested in have created structural inequalities that have you know, persisted for decades, essentially. And Rochester is no exception to that, unfortunately. And um, this graph speaks to those inequalities that when you look at the social gradient of health that you see it in a variety of ways and most notably also when it comes to race with, um, now this is way pre-pandemic ending in 2010, but it just shows the continued inequities that have persisted. And this really comes down to a big piece of why we underperform and that has to do with fairness and and um, how we treat one another. It's really important for every single human being to feel that they're being treated fairly. And we see this in a variety of ways and we definitely see it when we look at the population data, but it really makes a big difference. So this is sort of the why of this work in many respects. And the other thing that's missing from this is that emotional health really matters. Um, you know, for a long time, this was not sort of seen as part of healthcare, it was sort of on its side, but we've also over the last two years really come to appreciate how this is. So let's just talk about that for a second. So half of us will experience a diagnosis of a major mental illness in our lifetime with anxiety and depression being the most common. So that means not a single person in this room will not be touched in some way by mental illness. Um, disability is the number one cause, or excuse me, depression is the number one cause of disability around the world. And um, it actually is considered more of a threat to global health than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And in addition, the medical field is not exempt to this. Um, you know, so one or more physicians a day commit suicide. And I don't know about you, but I have known who some of those people were over time. And I don't give this talk a single time or piece of this talk without thinking about them by my side and how 
we can all make a difference in this component, but we have to start paying better attention to how our colleagues are doing and how we're supporting one another. And um, despite how important mental health is, it only gets 2% of global funding when it comes to thinking about healthcare. Um, believe it or not, this has gone up from 1% last year to, after <laughs> all of the things of the pandemic, we're finally at 2%. And then of course we all got 2020, we experienced the pandemic. All of us experienced loss and grief in different ways. There's not a single person that wasn't touched by this in some capacity. And um, yet we also have to start asking this question because we now have also, since I was a medical student here, learned all the different ways that traumatic experiences can impact our health, um, particularly when we're kids. We also have to start thinking about uh, post-traumatic growth, which is the upside to thinking about trauma and thinking about, you know, we can't change the experiences that happen to us, but we can um, we can change how we respond to them and how we learn from them and grow. So maybe even with that, just take a second and think about what's a superpower that you discovered about yourself during the pandemic? So just think about it. Actually, anyone wanna share? <laughs> resiliency yeah i'll tell you i learned flexibility from scheduling this lecture <laughs> so, <laughs> but i suspect we all did in different ways so it really comes down to asking this question you know, what what would it take to choose kindness in these different moments we have acknowledged that we're all human. We tend to have our moments, um, but at the same time, we always have a choice. And what's amazing is we actually have like infinite number of choices. And during our days, our interactions and in micro moments, there are opportunities. So we're gonna talk about three specific ways that you can sort of think about how to infuse a little bit more kindness and amplify that superpower of yours that you've got in your toolkit. Um, and before we do, I just want to set the framework for this. Um, so this was actually, after all this thinking through of all these different topics, all my education at Rochester, my psychiatry residency and research fellowship, it kind of felt like it came down to this pretty simple diagram, but it's very much in the spirit of Dr. Engel's work. And that's the idea that we are not just thinking about health in terms of biomedicine, that we're, we also need to include the hidden factors of health or the social determinants, all those different areas and ecosystems we talked about. And then it's also our mental health, of course, and true health is somewhere in the middle. And that explains in Dr. Engel's paper, he talks about, you know, how could it be that somebody is, you know, is sick, but functioning well, or um, well, but feeling sick. And this kind of gets at that model. So let's talk about that. So number one, kindness pause. Let me just check the time here. So um, it turns out we are uh, kinder when we take a little bit of time and are not in a rush. And just think of your days because I suspect they're probably filled with lots of rushing from to and from. So this is actually partly known from this fabulous study that was done back in the 70s at, as well in, at Princeton University that uh, it was a study that was done by two researchers who were interested in the question of, is kindness a moral principle, a character principle, or is it situational? And so they asked uh, seminary students if they were, or they asked seminary students, um, they took a group of about 40 students and they asked them to prepare a lecture, some of them to prepare a lecture on the Good Samaritan principle. So, you know, the idea of helping somebody in distress. And then they um, told about a third of the group that um, we need to, well, they told everybody, we gotta move the location of the lecture. Um, it's not gonna be here, it's gonna be across campus. And a third of the group, they said, you are um, early, take your time, get over there. A third of the group, they said, you're perfectly on time, but you, you do need to move over there. And then a third of the group, they said, you're late, you gotta get moving over there. 
And so it turned out that um, in the first two conditions, the student, oh, they put as a part of the study, they hired an actor who was in clearly in need of distress and basically put them in the path of between the first location and the second location. And I don't know if this is true or not, but it's been described to me that they practically had to like step over the person to like get to where they were going. And it turned out that only, um, that only in the first two conditions, the people that were on time or had a little extra time, most of them stopped, not everybody, but most of them stopped. And um, in the condition that people were late, only 10% of participants stopped. So here they were kind hearted theology students and they going to give a lecture about the Good Samaritan principle and they blew right by somebody who was hurt. So what this speaks to and what's neat is there's actually been subsequent data around this showing that when we pause, even for a brief period, we're actually less biased as well. Um, and again, this gets at because we're not in that lower cortical fight or flight, we're in using our higher executive functioning, we're able to think through things a little bit more and to be kinder. So what does this mean for our day to day? I mean, part of it means we got to pause a little bit more and be more intentional about how we do things. And um, actually, in that spirit, let's be here now for a second. So um, you can close your eyes for a second if you like. We're just going to take some deep breaths. And while you're breathing, also think about how you're surrounded by this incredible community here. Both here at the medical center and also for those of you that are virtual, that's just amazing that we have that technology that we can all be together. So if you wanna go ahead and wiggle your toes and fingers and wake up a little bit, um, there are different ways to introduce pauses, and I'll be curious to hear from some of you how you do this in your practice, whether you're walking into a patient room and you just pause briefly before you enter in and gather yourself, um, before you have a difficult conversation with a colleague or a family member, um, taking some deep breaths. It's funny, my kids now know about these like three deep breaths to pause, and so they'll sometimes catch me doing it while I'm talking with them. <laughs> So, but you can often do it unnoticed with other people. Um, so, or also taking a minute on your team rounds to check in, just like see how people are doing emotionally before you start the day. And you can do that on like a scale of one to five. You can just do it, um, you know, as a quick round to say like, where are you at today? How's your day going for any reason at all? It just acknowledges that whole human. All right, and then intentional random acts of kindness. So it's, you know, this is a sign by the artist Marty Kornfeld that says, if we all do one random act of kindness daily, we might just set the world the right direction. And Marty's not a scientist, but it turns out that's true because um, studies done by Sonia Lubomirsky have supported this. And it's quite interesting because, you know, doing like five random acts of kindness over a certain time period, and then, you know, like it's not just an immediate and boost of well-being. It also follows for you know, the weeks that after the random acts of kindness. And then there have been studies that have been shown in the workplace that she's also done that um, if you're assigned five people to do a random act of kindness for, because you're scanning, looking for ways you can do something kind, that that also boosts morale in workplaces as well and makes people feel more connected and supported as well. And it's fun too. And it doesn't have to take much time. It can be something small, like a compliment. And then gratitude, which is such a, okay, is such a underlooked and appreciated um, and well-researched actually way of boosting kindness and well-being. And um, it's quite remarkable. So, you know, it's got all these health benefits and the list is long with like no side effects, which is amazing. Um, and it can be hard to forget to do sometimes. So, um, so there've been studies that even like remembering one person in the morning to thank can, um, and if you do that sequentially for days in a row, um, can boost your mental well-being significantly by percentages. Um, and what's interesting about that, the reason is because, again, it's scanning your environment, looking for the positive and looking for the ways that you can continue to express gratitude and, and appreciating the people that are around you too has been shown through positive psychology studies to 
give a real boost. This thing in the corner is actually from a school, um, and you can do it in workplaces too, where little notes that you know when some when there's something you're grateful for, you put it in, and it you know at the end when it gets full, you bring them all out, you read them aloud, and maybe throw a little party or something. But um, it's funny; it's a simple thing, but people love it, and um, it seems to really boost uh, community morale. So, in the spirit of uh, Meliora and Ever Better and where we are. And also um, thinking about the work of Dr. Marowitz and everything that has happened here and uh, Dr. Engel. I think um, it's a nice time to reflect on, think of and imagine what could, our, what could our world look like if we were all a little bit more intentional about kindness. And you know, maybe it's that every, every child or every person feels seen, valued, supported, loved. Maybe it's that every person, no matter what challenges they've faced, you know, feels that they have something to contribute and a way to, to add to experiences. And maybe it's that every person feels a part of a community, like the community that we're fortunate enough to be a part of here. So just keep that in mind. And um, the other thing I want to say is because of this work, I know that I hear all kinds of stories. And I know that it doesn't, the, even the smallest act of kindness, you may never know how much that benefits somebody else. And I have people, what's really amazing about working on kindness is people send me all kinds of like incredible stories about kindness that's happened to them. And it's always striking to me because the person who was on the receiving end often doesn't even know, or excuse me, the person that was on the giving end doesn't even know the impact. So I would just encourage you to amplify that superpower you've got of kindness, um, continue to think about it and recognize that, um, yeah, it's something that we can all do something about. So with that, I'll go ahead and end. Um, and I think we've got some time for some questions too, if there's anyone. But uh, thank you all. It's such an honor to be here finally <laughs> and to, yeah, to get this opportunity to be together. Thank you. Oh, hi there, Tim. Hi. Um, I'm not a plant, but um, I want to know that I Oh, thank you. And I'm so delighted that you're able to be here. And actually, Tim is very much in line with sort of that idea of how can you boost social connection. So, you know, doing projects with people is a, one way to incorporate that. Um, I mean, of course, we all know the data. I forgot to mention this, but, you know, it. thank goodness we have a Surgeon General now who's talking about connection and emotional health. And, um, you know, because we know also the flip side of all this, right, that um, social isolation, loneliness are detrimental to health and as detrimental as well-established risk factors, like, you know, it's the classic smoking 15 cigarettes a day, um, Julianne Holstead's uh, studies, um, or even things like high blood pressure, heavy alcohol use, um, even being severely overweight. And yet I think um, this is something that's changed since I was here as a student talking about that social connection and social support is actually a critical part of health. So when we're thinking about lifestyle, we're not just thinking about you know, the diet, exercise, sleep. We're also thinking about who's in your life, who are you diet, exercising and sleeping with? Um, it's all of these questions um, sort of looking up and looking around and recognizing that we are such social creatures and none of our health is happening in a vacuum. Oh. The question of life. Um, the topic seems like the primary strategy is current politics. Is there a cost of this divisiveness on our culture or even our health? Oh, so there was a question about conflict. Um, and 
I'll just go ahead and repeat it. And is there a cost to this? So, um, so conflict is actually an important part of life. It's part of, you know, just interacting with people. Um, the question is, can we have differences of opinion and still manage to treat one another with dignity? And, um, and actually be able to have discussions in a way that's productive and fruitful. And we're actually better when we're able to work through differences. Um, but of course, um, you know, our brains have a negativity bias. So often in the news, we see the negative immediately. And, um, and yes, conflict has a real repercussion, um, public health wise in so many ways, but being mindful of that, that it's not it's not just a disagreement, thinking about are there ways that we can continue to, to see the other person as a whole person and separate the person from the problem. Hi, what's your name? Oh, say your name. Hi, Mike. You too. Well, so it's varied. So kindness is sort of this umbrella term, but I use it in part because it's well understood by every person from like the littlest kid to, you know, the oldest adult. And so um, there are kind initiatives. Um, and actually, I, you know, right now with Vivek Murthy and um, the position he's in, I know that there are many in the pipeline too, um, particularly around social connection, which, um, you know, of course we've all experienced a disruption in um, over the last two years. And it's been on everybody's mind much more and also the detrimental effects of that. So I'm hopeful that there is more to come. I would say on a more local level though, like think about your workplace. Like, is there anything in your environment or in your neighborhood that you could do to, this is where we have so much agency. This isn't just things happening to us. We can also affect the world around us in this lovely ripple effect. So. Think about is there a change I could make? Like, um, you know, I somewhat half joke, but like appoint yourself chief happiness officer. Like, can you go in and you know think about a way you could support a colleague who's having a hard time? Is there something that you could do to lend a helping hand or boost morale? And um, you know, I think a lot of times people feel like when things get tough, the kindness goes by the wayside. But in reality, that's almost when we need it the most to know that that support is there because. The amazing thing about humans is how resilient, to Ed's point, how resilient we are. Like we can get through some incredibly hard things if we feel that other people have our back, that we have a sense of purpose in what we're doing. Um, but it can also be very easy to forget that if we're in an environment that doesn't feel like it's seeing us and valuing us. Hi. Oh, thank you. That was kind of you, because I am looking this way. Yeah. Because they feel so strongly that this does affect that person's well being. So I would thank say. You for supporting Absolutely. And I actually I want to just highlight to what you're saying. So, you know, what's exciting is there's actually a lot of data around this and a lot of it from fields that I feel like often don't interact with medicine, like positive psychology. So I've been going to these positive psychology conferences and it's so funny because I'm like often the only psychiatrist there. And um, it's really interesting because kind of like the way that medicine and public health don't always talk, you know, the fields of mental health and say psychology don't always talk as well what's going on. So I think as we're moving into a more holistic thing, we can, there's so much data out there and it's like study after study just replicates the same finding which basically comes back to that one slide that's like be kind be grateful <laughs> and um pay attention to it it's it's often what makes life meaningful and um 
I know for me, something that is really meaningful is being here with all of you and having this opportunity to, to do that. So thank you. Is, um, is there any other questions? So. There's one more line of Sister Craig Short. Oh, Heidi, um, hello. She wanted to <laughs> share a quote from Dr. Bob Joyce called The Puzzle of Rhythms. You can't always be right, but you can always be kind. And she has a question. Any thoughts about how we navigate the externally imposed expectations on clinicians, our views, billing, et cetera, and the need for many clinicians to truly connect with their patients? Yeah. So a, joint, a Bob jointism, it's a, it's a good one. So, so I think that's the reality too. There's what we can do, and actually it gets back to Dr. Engel's model. You know, there's sort of what we can do internally um, among ourselves to boost our own sense of well-being and happiness. And then there's also things that we can do externally. Um, and that's also creating kind systems for where we are and thinking about the humans that are involved in the systems that we create that I think um, is no surprise. Uh, many of them are not as kind as we think. So um, I think being mindful of that and, and looking at sort of what's working, using appreciative inquiry to look at what's working well, areas that we can't, that maybe we need to do better with, um, but also being aware that, you know, we're not just entrusted with the health of the people we serve, but we're entrusted with the health of our colleagues and to pay attention to that and to, to you know, treat them as kindly as we can. The other thing is, I have to say, um, it's often easier to be kind, especially in giving and helping professions, it's easier to be kind to others than to ourselves. So also recognizing when something doesn't feel kind to you and um, thinking about ways that adjustments can be made. Um, I think also, I just have to say this too, a big, a big point of this system is also to make it a culture where people um, don't necessarily have to be perfect and that mistakes can be made and people can be human and that you can learn from your mistakes and, um, you know, and also talk about when we're having the rough days. Like I, you know, I shared with the emotional check-in pauses, like I do that now with like every time I meet with a group of students, like tell me about what's going on. Cause the thing is, if we can kind of normalize where things are not going well and can see it and reduce the shame around that, we can do a world of good, even within the house of medicine. Oh, it's just David. You comment about, you talk about what we can say. Yeah. I think research wise, that's an open question to sort of see where this all goes. Um, the other side of that though, because it's true, we all need human connection and it comes in different forms. And for many of us, it's our workplaces and our colleagues and our support that we get there that's important. You know, for other people, it might be, you know, the people that are in their home or the ability to connect with nature or be somewhere else. So I think in some sense, they're, there are pros and cons, and it's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, the other thing that is happening, and I'm hearing a lot of discussions around my non-physician friends too, and actually some who are doing telehealth too, is um, that you're able to um, sort of recognize, because we've sort of had this ridiculous like work-life balance, but the reality is we just have one life, and it's so much easier to do the laundry when you're, um, you know, on a Zoom call as opposed to like having to get dressed and go into a place to go do it. And um, so I, I do wonder there'll be some shakeout of, of how we go forward with this. But I think you're right, it's, it's here to stay as, as this talk is proof of that, you know, half our participants are not in this room with us, but we are so glad you're here. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. Oh wait, did Larry, did you have a question? <laughs> We actually have one minute. I gotta, I gotta hear your question. <laughs> I'm gonna hit you with the impossible question. First of all, I want to second the endorsement of somebody else who's writing a book and that's the wonderful. Everybody got that. Uh, it is such a win-win proposition for a person. It gives us a person to see. Yeah. And 
there's an evolutionary advantage. What are the barriers? The highest is just the universal response. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I love that, right? Um, thinking about why isn't the the universal response? I think, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Like, what are the barriers to kindness, and how can we start to address them? Um, I mean, I do think we live in this like increasingly busy, pressurized world. It feels like, and um, you know, where people wear busyness with a badge of honor, and actually. I, you know, one thing that I've started to spend some time thinking about is we spend a lot of time thinking about our work ethic and how important that is, but we also don't think about like our rest ethic. Like, do we take time to take a break, to recover, to reconnect with people that we love and what's meaningful to us? I know I've not done that sometimes, so I imagine you all have struggled with that too. Um, so sort of rethinking somewhat like our mindset about that. Um, in some ways, the pandemic did that for us. It allowed people to sort of reset what's important. Um, and then I think there another big barrier, and we see this in any newspaper you open up um, or in some of the you know divisions that go on, is this idea of like us versus them. And sort of, um, I think this is, I have to say, it's so funny because I go around and I talk to all these different groups about kindness and they are coming from all these different perspectives. And there's kind of this universal sense that like we're kind, it, the problem is those other people over there. <laughs> so, um, but it's funny because the reality is I think, you know, we all have our moments. We're all not kind all the time. Um, people can have pockets of incredible kindness and still do horrible things. So, um, you know, we have to just realize this is, uh, again, it's it's not a global uh, label. It's also that we each have this capacity within us. And the hope is that the more mindful we are about it, the more we create systems that enable kindness and frankly, work cultures that enable kindness that um, that will help make more supportive places. Um, I would love to hear more though, because I, I agree. It's not an answered question. Say that again. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I love that. And especially I'm, you're sitting next to Stephanie, I'm just thinking about her work and, you know, all the work that's happening around narrative medicine too, with this idea of when we reflect, it's really powerful because it allows us, it gets back to that um, traumatic growth. Like how do we process what has happened to us? How do we learn from it? How do we do better next time when we're in the same situation and scenario? So um, thank you so much. And tell me your name again. Crescent. Okay. Crescent. Um, so thank you for Crescent for ending on that note. It's um, I, I know we're up on time. Speaking of time, but um, really, um, oh, I forgot an assignment. Uh, if you could just think of somebody that you're grateful to, and um, first wish them well in your heart, and then um, if you could also just take a moment to you know text them, write them a note to just say how much you appreciate what, who they are for you too um, is your homework assignment. <laughs> so sorry, always an educator. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody.